uh, if you have your Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, and uh, we're going to look at verses 38 through 42. I'm going to read out of the NLT. If you're in overflow, what's up, my people, what's going on? And uh, if you see me on screen, I hope I look incredible, praise God. And uh, when I go to the barber shop, you know, I ask them to put a little, ksh, ksh, you know, in my hair to, you know, make the line a little sharper, you know what I'm saying? Pray. Now, this is my hair. There's no fake hair up here. This is my beard, but, you know what I mean? You tell the barber, just a, ksh, ksh, you know, it's a little, ksh, ksh, you know what I'm saying? Just to, just to make the line, you know what I mean? Just so if the line looks sharp, it's to, ksh, ksh, you know what I mean? So uh, I get nervous when I sweat. I'm a, I sweat a lot. You see me preach, and so you know I can't stand still, and so I move a lot. And so when you sweat, you know, the kind of you know just starts to run. So if you ever notice when I get my towel, I, I pat, I pat, you know, I don't, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really wipe like the old school preacher, you know what I'm saying? I kind of be like, <laughs> and you be like, Pastor, just he wipes his sweat so smooth. No, it's the I'm trying to keep it in there, I'm trying to <laughs> make sure it's there. That's why this is black, you know what I'm saying? I, I <laughs> Give me a black towel. I told him only black towel, man. Ah, yeah, praise God. So overflow, stop laughing. Uh, all right. Y'all ready? We're supposed to read the scripture. Okay. It says, as Jesus and the disciples, I'm in Luke 10, verse 38. I'm starting at, uh, in the NLT. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. By the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Martha was definitely on the dream team. She was on the dream team. She said, is it fair? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. The title of my message today is Stop Running on E. Stop running on E. Do me a favor, push the person next to you and say, stop running on E, please. Can you stop running on E? Stop running on E. And if they look mad at you, push them again and say, I said, I said. Father, we need a word. Overflow right now. We need a word to hit this room, to hit our lives. We desperately need you to say something. No talent. We just want the word of God. We want the power of God to fall in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say. Everybody say. Stop running on E. Okay, you're going to get to know your neighbor really well, real quick. Those on YouTube, those in Overflow. I have a question for you. Have you ever run out of gas? Okay, let's get to know each other. Ask your neighbor, what's your gas meter on right now? Ask them, is it, ask them, what is it on now? Is it full? Half full. Come on, just ask them. Overflow. Ask them. Overflow. Walk to somebody and say, what's your gas meter on right now? Is it on full? I have experience running out of gas a couple of times in my life. And uh, I, I've been on a highway and I had to pull over on the side of the road. And I've, I've had to get off an exit and uh, my car just cut off. And then somehow I got it to turn back on, push the gas, run through red lights to get to a gas station just to get in there and get some gas. I have been there, done that, got the T-shirt. The three of y'all from the 90s. Thank you for knowing that. I understand how crazy it makes you feel. When you run out of gas, overflow, it is scary when your car just shuts off and you're sitting there saying, OMG, what happened? How in the world did I run out of gas? And that's really the question. The question is, how did you run out of gas? Don't you got a gas meter? <laughs> the light was on for days. <laughs> it told you, go get some gas. It's a ding, 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 ding. The light was flashing. 
It was sitting right there. You can see it. It's, it's, it's hanging low. And you still didn't get gas. I mean, you're sitting there just trying to figure out why didn't I get some gas? I have been, I've had the experience where I have literally been on the side of a highway, walking down a highway, trying to go to the gas station. I got to put some gas in this little thing right here. And I have been on a highway walking. Saying, why didn't I get some gas? Have you ever stopped and, and just said, why didn't I do it? Why didn't I just stop? What was I thinking? Everybody in this room have tested faith. Because there's two types of people in this room. There are two types of responses, should I say, to a low gas meter. One response is when I see a gas meter that says E, I pull over. I see it as a warning, as an instruction. Pull over, get gas. But then there are other people in the room, when you see it go E, it is a challenge. <laughs> it is a dare. It is an opportunity to walk by faith overflow and not by sight. All of us have tested fate to see how long we could go without gas. And we say stuff to ourselves because we will pass the gas station and we'll be like, you know what, the next one. There's another one at another exit. There's another one down the street. I'll bump into one, the next gas station. Next time I see a gas station, then I'll stop. You say stuff like tomorrow. Come on, the wine is you say, tomorrow. Get some gas tomorrow. Some, some of you just say tomorrow. I thought about today, but oh, we no. You 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 just said tomorrow. I'll get some gas. Get, get some gas. Some of you become scientists and say, you know what? The meter. Something's wrong with the meter. The meter is not really reading the way it's supposed to read. They try to be a mechanic, Mark. They try to yeah yeah. It's it's the meter. The meter. This is not real. Some people, when they see the gas meter low, you say stuff like, I've, I've, I've been this low before. I've gone this long without gas before. Nothing happened last time. I'm sure nothing's going to happen this time. I asked my wife, who does this religiously. I said, babe, why don't you ever stop to get gas? She said, because I know what my car feel like. It doesn't feel like it's going to break down. Don't, it don't feel, I can feel the car. I feel when I'm driving, I'm one with the car. I feel it, and it just don't feel like it's going to break down. Some people say, I got time. I got time. I got time. I got time. I will, and guess what? You think you have time. You think you can do it tomorrow. You think you can go get to the next gas station, and you will find yourself on the side of a road. One to punch yourself. Why didn't I get some gas? I, I could have just stopped and get some gas. And now I'm walking down a dark valley. Now I'm in this dark highway. Now I'm scared because I'm walking by myself. And I should have just stopped to get some gas. You start thinking about all the times that you should have just stopped to get some gas, but I didn't. And so now here you are. You are just walking down trying to get some gas. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. And there are many of us in this room that are spiritual gas meter. The light is on. It's a warning sign. And it's telling you you need some gas because here's what happens. What happens is that you come to church and, and you come, bless God in the sanctuary. Bless God when it is empty. Every chance I get, I'll bless you. And so you leave here filled up. You leave here just all full spiritual, take full. But then here comes Monday. Here come kids. Here comes spouse, here come deadlines, here comes boss, here comes customers, here comes clients, here comes bad weather, here comes a new roof, here comes the house flooded, 
Here comes the family trip that we got to pay for. I don't know how we're going to pay for it. And here, here comes, oh, this flight and this paper and this thing. And before you know it, you are leaking everything you got filled up with on Sunday. And your Bible sits on the table saying, hey, read me. <laughs> Worship songs are just waiting for you. Come, come, just Prayer in the morning is just calling your name, but you don't stop to get gas. And you don't stop to get spiritual gas for the same reasons why you don't stop to get natural gas. You say, ah, I'll catch the next catalyst. I'll miss this freedom conference. The next one comes around, then I'll get free. Ah, uh, I'll read my Bible tomorrow. There's this, this a lot going on today. Tomorrow, I'll, I'm first thing tomorrow, I'm going to start in Genesis. Some of you have been, some of you have been starting the one-year Bible all year. You've been starting it. You, you've been in Genesis all year doing the one-year Bible. I'm not, I'm saying it because I know I've done it. You say, oh, it's, maybe it's not God. I'm just tired. I just need sleep. I just need rest. Some of you, uh, it's, oh, I know what it is. I just need a sneaky link for the weekend. Overflow, they're in here going crazy. I don't know what y'all doing in there, but somehow they know what that meant, so... That's all I need. I just need a night out. I just need to wild out for a weekend. I, I just need to go crazy for a weekend because I've just been all stuffy. And what I really need is just to turn up. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, it don't feel low. I've gone this long without church before. I've gone this long without prayer before. I've gone this long without reading my word. And nothing's happened before. So I know this time I'll be all right. Oh, I got time. And so now here it is. You have skipped all the gas stations. You have skipped all the parts and all the moments and all the areas where you could have got some filling, where you could have got some, some gas in your spiritual tank. And because you missed it, now you are on the side of the road depressed. Now you're car has broken down. Now your marriage is breaking down. Now your mind is breaking down. Now anxiety is greater than it's ever been. Now you're taking more pills than you've ever taken. Why? Because you are breaking down mentally, emotionally, physically, because you won't stop to get some gas. But today, I came to tell you, overflow, I came to tell you that your spiritual meter, the light is on, and it's time to stop running on E. You got to get filled up this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not because you might be, you shall be if you want to be filled, he will fill you. If you ask him to fill you, he will fill you. God is ready to fill your tank, but he needs you to get some hunger. He needs you to pause and say, wait a minute. Let me stop and get filled up. Ask your neighbor, are you running on E? Ask him, ask him. Say, don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer that. You know what's annoying? You know what's annoying? You know, what, you know what's really annoying? You know what's really annoying? What's really annoying is when you're on the side of the road and you're waiting for AAA, or you gotta sit there waiting for, you gotta put this gas thing in. You start thinking, it don't take that long to get gas. It's really quick. It's really quick. It's like, it's, it's 10 minutes. But what happens is when you're so busy, and you're such in a rush to get to the next destination. When you are so focused on everything else, what ends up happening is something that should be so simple feels so complicated because I'm so busy. And, and so you start thinking, and it's amazing to me because gas costs you $60, $40, $50, $80, $90. And you're saying that's too much. You should have just stopped to pay the 80. Now you're paying $800 because you went so long without gas, you got to fix the engine. 
And many of us in this room, spiritually, it don't cost you nothing to read the word for 10 minutes. It don't cost you nothing. We do an hour and 15 minutes, or we're not doing, come on, this is not your grandmother's church. We don't do Sunday school and then three hours of service and then eat dinner and then come back for Bible class and then come back for afternoon service and then come back. We don't make you do all that. We give you an hour and 15 to get filled up, bless God, in the sanctuary. It don't cost you that much to get on your knees and pray. It don't, but what happens is when you're so busy, and when you running so much and you just trying to get to the next level, get to the next season, get to the next destination, all of a sudden this just feels like I got to do all this. I don't have any time to pray. But see, you see, see, it costs, what is it costing your marriage now? So now you got a bad engine and a car that won't drive because you didn't want to take 10 minutes. Just to say, God, see, that's what I'm saying. I'm not, nobody's here, here saying, because I know us. We will go extreme and we'll say, see, this is why I'll, I just want to send this presence. No, no, no. God's saying, can you wake up in the morning and give me 10 minutes? God's saying, come on now, can you just come to one service? Can you just have some time with me? Can you just pray? Can you just, before you leave your house, say, let me pray and ask God to cover this day? Because many of the challenges that you have would be fixed if you would just pull over, get to the spiritual gas station, just get one worship song in the morning will change your whole mood. You wouldn't need all the stuff you need to get you hyped up to it. You got to get hyped up too. I'm going to really get in trouble. Overflow, watch my back. Safety, because we always like to talk about those people smoke that weed. We always like to talk about the people who drinking all the alcohol. Let me talk to my coffee drinkers real quick. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, yeah. There's another drug in this room. There's another substance in this room. You fight for your coffee. You give me my coffee. I need my coffee. I've got to have my coffee. Give me another cup. Give me another cup. Can you, pr can you fight for your prayer time? Can you fight for your scripture reading? Can you fight? You stand in line. For as long as you can to get that, to get the magic in the cup. But I don't have time. See, we tell, I just think we've gotten too busy for God. God, I, I, I would pray, but you know I got school. You on your 10th degree. And you got a job that don't match none of the degrees that you got. The degree you get now, you still want another job in a different field than the degree you got. But, but for some reason, you have given all this time to school and you're too busy for God. You got this little boyfriend. I know guys got girlfriends, but I'm talking to y'all right now. You got this little boyfriend. And it's like, God, you know I'm busy. God, you, you know it's a deadline. God, you know my birthday's coming. God, you know there's a family trip. God, you know people are coming into town. God, you, you know what's going on in my life. He's saying, yeah, I know what's going on in your life. And I know that if you don't stop for a second and let me pour into you, if you don't stop for a second and let me fill your tank, I know that you're not going to make it the rest of the year. Why is your soul so broken down? And let, can we be honest? Let's just keep it 100. You know that when you are not being filled by God, your carnality is just a little bit higher. You cuss just a little easier. And you're like, wait, why is my language changing? Because I'm on E. You start wanting to be with people you never want to be with. If you, were, if you was filled, you would never give this person the time of day. But because I'm on E and I ain't got the strength to say no, I ain't got the strength to be sober enough to walk away from this because I ain't got no strength in me. I have now dummied down to something that I know is toxic. And then when you get filled up, you're saying, what was I thinking? What was I doing? What was I talking about? That's how he got you. He got you because you was on E. He would have never had a shot if you were filled up. 
but because you was on E, he looked cuter than he really is. Because you was on E, he smelled better than he really does. See, see. See, when you're filled up and he's sitting in somebody else's car, laid all the way back, you would have been like, oh, that don't make sense. But when you're on E, it's like, look how cute he is. Oh my God. He just lay back. Oh. Push your neighbors. Look at a woman and say, I think he's talking to you because he can't be talking about me. He can't be talking about me. Overflow, stop laughing in there. I'm just trying to say, what is it really costing you? Because you wake up in the morning and hear snooze, and just, I gotta wake up early. I gotta wake up 30 minutes more early. Yes. But it costs so much to wake up so early. Yeah, but it's costing you so much not having your spiritual tank full. It's costing your family not coming to church on a Sunday. It's costing you something. And so you're worried about $80 gas, but what about a $1,000 engine? You got to put everything in the right perspective. This is why I read the text. Is this good? Are y'all getting something out of this? This is why I read. I'm taking my time because I'm not trying to rush through this. I'm not trying to hype you this morning. I'm really trying to help you. And, uh, and uh, in the text, in the text, I see Martha. Martha, I like Martha. Martha reminds me of my mother. Martha reminds me of my mother. Why I say my mother? Because my mother, when, when guests would come to the house, my mother had this thing where the house had to be clean, food had to be in the fridge, everything had to be right. Now imagine Jesus, not fake Jesus, not in the air imagery, not, not Jesus in a movie. Now, I'm talking about real Jesus is coming over. He'll be over at 3 o'clock. Tell me what your day is going to be like. Jesus, he's coming over at 3. All right, Martha's like, all right, pick that stuff up. Come on, get that up. Get these toys out of here. Make sure to clean it up. I, I see dust over there. Get that dust out the way. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Jesus is coming over. Uh-uh. Pick those clothes up. Pick those clothes up. Pick those clothes up. Let me wash these clothes. Let me get up out of here. And so now Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Now think about this. Come on now. Just think about this. I know this is Jewish culture, but let's Americanize this just for one second. That's how I can feel it. Now, now she's thinking, now listen, do, I, do I make chicken? Do I make pot roast? What do I make? Does Jesus want some cornbread with some collard greens? Does Jesus want some black eyed peas? What does Jesus want? Some rice? All right, let me put this stuff together. And so she's sitting here cooking and she's getting everything ready. She, she probably went to Whole Foods. She didn't even go to Food Lion. She went to Whole Foods. She didn't go to Publix. She said, don't bring that Publix chicken up in here. She went all the way to Whole Foods. She said, cut me that real chicken in the back, that, that organic chicken. Give me that. She done got that and went there and she got the chicken and she's cutting up and she's ready. And so Jesus is here and everybody's going crazy. And so she's in there cooking, making sure the meal's right. And, and here she goes. She sees Mary, her sister. Mary, her sister, is sitting before Jesus. Bless God in the sanctuary. Bless God in the sanctuary. Every chance I get. How blessed. Now, you would think that Martha's like, look at her praise God. Look at her worship. No! Martha's saying, Do you? Martha's like, you see, that's my lazy behind sister. I, every time somebody come over, she want to be all up in their face. See, that's, that's her problem now. That's why she ain't got a man now, because she's always up in somebody's face. She's always, see, I'm trying to get her to learn. If you really want a man, you get in this kitchen. That's what she really need to do. And so she need to get herself up. She need to get in here and she needs to make sure that she, I can't, this is why I can't stand my sister. She gets on my last nerve, because, so I'm doing, so you want me, okay, so you're going to sit there and I'm going to do all the work by myself? Oh, see, oh no, oh, absolutely not. No, this is my problem. And so, and so Martha's so crazy. She's so mad. She don't even snap on her sister. She snaps on Jesus. She says, ah, oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to raise my voice. But uh, uh, don't you think it's unfair that you got me in here with the chicken and my lazy, no good sister is just going to sit there and lay before you this whole time? Don't you think that there's something wrong, Jesus. He says, he don't even, she don't even address her. She says, can you, Jesus, tell my lazy, no good sister, get her butt up and get in this kitchen and help me. Jesus looks at Martha, overflow, leaning right here. Jesus looks at Martha and said, Martha, you need to calm down. Martha, you worried about way too many things. He says, Martha, if you were smart, I'm paraphrasing, but read the text. If you were smart, you would know that I don't care nothing about your chicken. I don't care about your rice. 
I didn't come up here for no cornbread. If you knew who I really was, you would stop cooking and you would come sit with Mary because you would know that whatever it is that you need in your life, I got it. Can I tell you what Jesus is trying to say to us today? Don't come up in here and treat this so much like a routine that you miss God when he shows up in a room. Don't be so busy with your schedule that you miss God when he shows up. Don't be so uptight with all the stuff you got to do that when Jesus shows up in a room, you don't put your deadlines down. You don't put that paper down. You don't put that kids and stuff down. Open up your mouth and get what you need from God. I'm trying to tell you overflow, the presence of God was in this room. Now you could have sat there and just watched. You could have sat there and treated this like a common room or you could have said, wait a minute, if the God, if God is in the room, miracles are in the room. If God is in the room, blessing is in the room. If God is in the room, healing is in the How you got a cough and Jesus showed up and you too busy to stop and get healing for your cough? How you got all this anxiety about all this stuff happening in your life? Jesus hit the room and you didn't stop long enough to sit at his feet and say Jesus I got all this stuff in my mind can you give me some rest is there anybody in the room that says I'm not gonna miss it then when he shows up you some of the stuff you need he could answer but you miss him because you're so distracted and busy you running so much. Now, now this is not me saying, don't ever do anything. Only thing you do is worship God. Or, no, I am saying that as you are driving in your day, when you see a spot to pull over and get some gas, fill up. Why are you driving for months and days on E thinking you're going to make it to the next destination? You're going to find yourself pulled over on the side of the road. Is this good? Y'all getting some out of this? Okay, okay. Let me give you three things. Overflow, write this stuff down. Let me teach you something. Let me give you three things. We're going to get some people saved. We're going to give. We're going to get out of here. Number one, don't become so busy serving Jesus that you forget to sit with Jesus. Please write that down. Don't become so busy serving Jesus that you forget to sit with Jesus. Psalm chapter 84, verse 10, NIV, says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. David said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Let me bring it to the NLT. It says, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, vacation's cool. Vegas, Miami, going on the beach. But better is one day in his courts than a week in Vegas. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere living your good life. I'd rather spend one day with God then live the good life with my people on a cruise, you turn up. No, he's saying, are you crazy? Some of you go on vacation, you come back tired and broke. But you spend 10 minutes with God, speaking in tongues, listening to worship, and you come out refreshed and revived and renewed. Why? Because better is one day in his courts than a thousand anywhere else, which means you got to fight for your time with God. You got to fight for your time with God. The greatest fight, one of the greatest fights you're ever going to have in your life is fighting for your devotional time with God. Even here at Union Church, if you serve in Union Church, one thing you know about our church is that we make you sit one, serve one. Why do we make you sit one, serve one? Because we recognize that if you just serve a whole day, but you never spend a whole week or any time sitting and receiving, it's not going to last. So we got to get you to sit for a little bit. Why? Because it's so, I'm not saying, oh, I'm taking the next six months. No, no, no. It's I've got to fight. That's why Jesus says when you pray, say, give us this day our what bread? He didn't say weekly bread. He didn't say monthly bread. He didn't say give us our yearly bread. He said, no, give me today my daily 
bread, manna, which means you have something for me today that will not be here for tomorrow. And you have something for me for tomorrow that will not be there for the next day. Today, you got to fight for your daily bread, your daily time. It's literally in your car on your way to work. Put on your worship music and fill up your tank. It is literally taking a praycation. What's a praycation? I'm just taking two days off of work so I can pray. I'm just going away so I can pray. I'm just going to an empty room so I can pray. I'm just taking the day off just to pray. Why? Because you got to fill up your tank. Because if you don't, there will be nothing but distractions. Everybody say distractions. Overflow, lean in here. I need everybody to hear me when I say this. Me and my wife have been married now for 16 years, going on 17 years. And uh, when we first... When we were dating, we was in high school, and we were in college, first kind of years of college, last year high school, and uh, when we started dating, I mean, we worked at the same job. Our cubicles were right next to each other. And so we would be sitting next to each other in the cubicles, emailing each other. What you thinking about? What you thinking about? What's your day like? What's your day like? Man, you so funny. You so funny. Man, what's going on with you? What's going on with you? And then I get out of the cubicle and go to her desk and talk to her. So what you doing? What you doing? How's everything? How's everything? What's going on? What's going on with you? We go to lunch break together. To so girl, what's going on with your life? What's going on with your life? What's happening with you? What's happening with you? And then after work, we go out on a date. We go on a date that night and I be talking to her on my way to pick her up. I'll be there in 10 minutes. What you doing? No, what you doing? What you got going on? What you got going on? She come outside, and then we talk all the way to the date, and then we hang out after the date. After the date, I drop her off, and we were so crazy. It was like, call me when you get to the door. Let me know you made it safe. The door's right there. The door's right there. She's literally getting out the car. Call me when you get to the door. I need to know, because I'm a man. I'll protect you. And so... She's going to the door. She called me. I made it to the door. I said, all right, I see you. You made it to the door safe. And then on my way home, I get home. Hey, I made it home. What are you doing? No, what you doing? No, what you doing? What you doing? And then we go to sleep on the phone. We go to sleep just on the phone. Girl. And then we fall asleep. And then we wake up. Hey, you there? Yeah, I'm there. You here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, wow, wow. What you doing? No, what you doing? How's everything, How's everything with you? And then we repeat the exact same thing. We get to work in the cubicles and we do the same thing. Recently, probably like a month ago, we went, to, we went on a vacation. We went to Vegas to hang out for a week. And as we're in Vegas hanging out, I mean, we're talking and laughing. And we're sitting there saying, I, man, I, mi I miss this. I miss you. I miss you too. Now, you might be thinking, but you married. You've been together 16 years. How can you miss each other? Because I realize once you get married, here comes distractions. See, when we were dating, it was all about each other, just us, us, us. But then when you get married and kids and bills and the mortgage and the rent and house and the job and the church and make sure you got to pick that up and you're going to go to the grocery store and make sure you go get the clothes from the laundry, make sure you get the cleaners, and make sure all of a sudden now we realize that we miss each other because we have so many distractions. Can I tell you something? God misses you. John Maxwell, uh, one of the greatest authors on the planet, when he speaks to an atheist and an atheist says to him, hey, I don't believe in God. He says, yeah, I know you don't believe in God, but don't you just miss him? God misses you. You used to talk to God. Remember when you first got saved and it was just God all day and it was just your little Bible and you just took it out all the time and you had all these worship songs and, and you heard an R&B song and you said, ugh, this is nasty. And, ugh, you heard, I don't want to be a player. No, God, I'm so sorry. I can't believe there are people singing that song. I don't want to be a player no more. God I, God, I, God, I just can't stand it. And now God misses you, but you got sports for your kids. And God is in the background. And God is saying, can you get back with me? Okay, point number two. Point number two, write this down. Don't serve out of obligation. Serve out of overflow. Don't serve God or live for God out of obligation. Serve God out of overflow. Let me show you the scripture, overflow, lean it right here. Overflow, overflow, you see those points? Uh, let's look at John 
chapter 14, verse 15. John 14, 15. Please keep this scripture up. I dealt with this a little bit a few weeks ago, but let me just, just lean in it a little more. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Please keep that scripture up. Keep that scripture up over full leaning right here. Now, when I was younger, the church I was raised in, when I would see this scripture, I just remember being a young Christian, and I would see this scripture, and I would be like, oh, man, I got to keep all these commandments. Oh, God. Oh, I got I to gotta pray, and I got to live right, and I got to, and I felt this heavy weight on me, but as I got older, I realized that's not what Jesus said. See, when many of us read the scripture, we only read the B clause. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But what he's really saying is the A clause. He's saying, if you love me, you'll naturally do what I say. So in other words, don't focus on the commandments. Focus on the love. See, you see the scripture say, I got to focus on all these commandments. No, no, no. Focus on loving God. Because if you love God, God, doing what he says come natural. Serving God comes natural. It's not such a strain because I'm in love with God. I got to go to church. I get to do this. I don't have to do this. I get to do this because I like God. I love God. I enjoy God. If following his commandments is this big old task that you got to do is because you have not spent time falling in love with Jesus. You have not spent time cultivating this love relationship relationship with God because if you really love him then I don't mind tithing if you really love him I don't mind setting up and taking down if you really love him I don't mind leading worship why because I'm serving out of my overflow not out of my lack how did I work on this let me show you one of the ways one of the secrets that I worked on my love relationship with God it came in Luke chapter 7 verse 47 Jesus is talking about the woman uh, with the, the, the woman uh, uh, who came in uh, to the house and she had the alabaster box and she's wiping his feet with her hair he tells this to some onlookers he says I tell you her sins and they are many have been forgiven so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little only loves little. Keep that scripture up. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying that people who have a fresh revelation of how much I have forgiven them, their love flows. But people who are stank and arrogant and so conceited that you have forgotten how many things I have forgiven. You have forgotten how much stuff I've overlooked. You have forgotten how many of your sins I did not count against you. You walk in here like you doing me a favor. You walk in here like you, but anybody in the room say, no, he forgave my sins. No, he healed my diseases. No, he, he rescued my life. So I do this out of overflow. Put that down. I, I got to get free right now. Let me get free. Overflow. And I know I'm a little over time. If y'all give me just a couple minutes, I just got to get free. I've learned, I have a nine-year-old, eight-year-old. And I learned as a parent that there's unspoken rules that I was made aware of. One of those unspoken rules is that if you invite kids to your birthday party, and they show up, when they have a birthday party, you are expected to go to their birthday. Did y'all know about this? I did not know about this. So we were throwing parties, and kids was coming. And then my wife would come back to me, and she'd be like, hey, so you know, little Ronnie got a birthday party. And I said, good for little Ronnie. <laughs> no, we got to go. Why do we got to go? Because he came, they brought him to our birthday party. What they got to do with me? That was their decision. That was their choice. That ain't got nothing to do with me. And she's like, no, she had to teach me. No, it's an unspoken rule. Parents, am I saying the truth? Parents, am I? Somebody, y'all convicted. So what's supposed to happen is that if the kids come to your party, you now, so now I got to go to parties of kids. I don't even care about because they came to my party. 
Because you recognize that if somebody did something for you out of the overflow of your heart, you should want to do something for them. And God has said, I done came to all your party stuff. But how come every time I invite you to my party, every time I invite you to pray with me, every time I invite you to sit with me, every time I invite you to do something in my house, you always busy. Now, I showed up at your game. I showed up at your interview. Remember that interview you were struggling with? And I came in the interview and I blessed your life. And I got you the job. Remember that time you asked me to come to court with you because you knew that you was in the wrong, but you still needed some favor on your life. Remember that time you was in a doctor's office and you were scared what the doctor was going to say and you asked me to come. I came to your party. Why is it that it's six in the morning and I'm calling you to pray? You sleep during my party, but I'm woke during your party. God said, if I show up to your good God, I feel like pre God says, if I can show up for all your little stuff, can you show up for some of my, can I get some of your time? Shoo! Here's my last point. We out of here. I got five minutes. I'm going to do this in three. Thank you. You know what? I received that. You can't consistently pour into others without letting God pour back into you. You cannot consistently pour into others without letting God pour back into you. Luke chapter 5, verse 15, 16. Please watch this. Please put that scripture up. Watch this. Watch this. Overflow. Lean in right here. Overflow. Check me out. It says, yet the news about Jesus spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus did what? He withdrew often to lonely places and prayed. Keep that scripture up. You know what that scripture is saying? Jesus himself is saying, y'all can't have me out here doing all this preaching, doing all this healing, doing all this prophesying, but I don't get poured back into myself. Jesus is saying, if I'm out here doing all these miracles... Y'all not going to keep me out here. At some point, I got to go to a lonely place. And I got to get poured back into. If Jesus had to get poured back into, how much more you? You're doing all this preaching. You're doing all this singing. You're doing all this ministry. But you don't get poured back into? Okay, let's put ministry to the side for a second. Let me talk to the person who's the savior of the family. Because you save everybody in the family. Everybody gets in trouble, they call you. And you done got the whole family on your back, but you never get poured back into? How long you going to run on E? How long you think that's going to last? How long you think you can keep that up? No. You got to, you got to, you got to serve. Okay. All right. I'm done. But I like to, when I, when I preach, I, I, I ask God the way, the way my gift works. For me to feel something, I got to see it. And a picture. I'm a, I, I picture, picture, what they call an illustrative theologian. I got to see the picture. When I see the picture, I get it. And so as I was praying over this, God give me this picture. It's embarrassing, but it is what it is. I was a habitual overdrafter. I got you, sir. I know it's Charlotte. I know Bank of America's in here, but hear me. I was always overdrafted in my accounts. Matter of fact, you do too because I, I read a statistic yesterday that said last year $2.2 billion. The bank made $2.2 billion on overdraft fees alone. In fact, they cut fees because they were saying it was becoming illegal to charge people the fees they were charging. Even, even when they cut them, we still overdraft $2.2 billion. And so I used to overdraft. Overdraft means that I took more out the bank than I had in there. I withdrew more money than I deposited. And so I would just go in. I'm telling the truth. This is years ago. I don't live like this no more. <laughs> Overflow. Years ago, when I was in my teens, when I was 20, 20, I got a bank card when I was like 16. So, so in my teens, my early 20s, I would, if I had 200 in there, I might take 250. And I was so crazy, I would say, they used to charge you $35 for, for every time you overdraft. I used to say, I'll pay the 35 When I get paid, see, it's payday loan, you know what I'm saying? When I get paid, I'll pay it back. So I would overdraft. 
If you're out at a restaurant and you only got $60 in your account, but the meal was $65, you would tell them, swipe. Just don't talk. Swipe. And then when they would leave, you pray that a card would go through. And when it goes through, you knew there was only $60 in there. You knew they charged you $65. You had a nerve to still need a $5 tip. Because even though I tip, I tip from my overdraft. How, how insane is that? I done tipped you for money I didn't even have. What my bank came up with, though, they came up with something called overdraft protection. The way our overdraft protection worked at that time is if you had a savings account, what they would do is if you overdraft in this account, they would pull from the other account and pull it into this account so that you would never be empty in this account. And I came to tell you that Jesus is your overdraft protection because what he does is he stores up power in your savings reserve. So when you overdraft here, all of a sudden Holy Spirit goes into your spiritual reserve and gives you strength that you didn't know you needed. And so many of you, you have been running so fast and doing so much. You've been withdrawing more than you've been depositing. But when you get into the presence of God, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is putting some savings away. So worship that you got in here, he put that away in some savings. So when you overdraft it on Wednesday, because you weren't really thinking about your life. God says you can pull from this account, put it in this account. Why? Because God wants you to stop running on E. God wants to fill you. God wants to fulfill you. And this is a season of your life where you got to get filled with God. So fill me up till I overflow. I want to run home. I want to run, so fill me up till I, I want to run over, I want to run over. If you're in this room, the greatest deposit you can make right now is making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. All it simply means is I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe that he's alive and that the gospel I just heard, I'm walking in it from this day forward. There's no religious hoops you have to jump through. Just bow your head right now. We will pray a simple prayer. Overflow, I need you to bow your heads. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Lord, fill my life. Fill my heart. Fill my soul. I surrender my life to you. I believe. Jesus is Lord and today I surrender my life come into my heart save me now I am yours and you are mine in Jesus name